Morning. Morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. My name is Rich Dale. I'm CEO and founder of Flowlands. And I'm joined by Ian Smith from Fisher Smith, who are a Flowlands customer, and Mark, um, Mark Wood from Yes Tax, who are advisors um, to Fisher Smith. So thank you both for taking the time to, to share your experience today of, of R&D tax credits and how Flowlands has played a part in making that more efficient. Uh, first of all, could you, uh, Ian, could I ask you first to, to sort of introduce yourself? Yeah, certainly. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Smith. I'm director of Fisher Smith, and we're a uh, machine vision specialist company. Um, we supply uh, camera-based systems into automatic inspection um, tasks in industrial automation generally. So uh, often this is for quality control purposes using the cameras to uh, detect defects, measure products and sizes and shapes and um, things like that. So uh, we're a small team based in the Midlands in England, uh, cover the whole of whole of the UK with, with our, our products and services. Thank you, Ian. I'm Mark. Thanks very much, Rich. Um, my name is Mark Wood. Um, I'm a chartered accountant um, and a director of um, a company called Yes Tax, which were formed in in 2019. Um, we're a small team. Um, there's about ten of us. Um, we undertake research and development tax relief claims for all sorts of industries, all sorts of um, types of companies all over the UK. Um, as we, as we're in, we operate nationwide, but we're we're based up in Sheffield. Uh, we're a business for good, so 2.5% of everything that we, uh, all of our turnover is do it directly goes to charities um, which help vulnerable children both in the UK and overseas. Um, so yeah, I've been in this industry since 2010, um, so well over a decade now. Um, things have changed quite a lot in the industry, um, but hopefully today I can talk to you about some of the changes and some of the relevances to Flowlens and um, some of the up upcoming changes which might be relevant to some of the viewers today. Thank you, Mark, and uh, thanks to everyone who's joined. Um, we're recording the session, and if you have any questions, uh, please pop them in the, the chat. And um, we're going to work through the agenda here for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have time at, at the end if you have some questions. Um, so for those of you who don't know Flowlens, just in brief, we're a cloud-based uh, management system aimed towards uh, small equipment uh, manufacturing and uh, kind of uh, distribution companies. Um, our customers typically work um, in industrial settings as Ian has, has uh, described, um, and our customers make and supply a wide array of, of uh, equipment. Um, so Flowlands helps manage the business process from end to end, replacing spreadsheets, manual processes, paper, and bringing that into, into one, one system, typically integrated with uh, Xero or, or QuickBooks or Sage. Um, I think one of the things that struck me when Ian suggested that this would make a good topic uh, for, for a webinar was you know, how Flowlens reaches into every, every crevice of the, of the business process. And that there's many ways that you, you um, surprising to like us uh, here at the, in, in Belfast as to how Flowlands is making a difference. So um, I'm sure this uh, session will be very useful for, for existing customers and potentially future customers. Um, when we were preparing for this, uh, Mark, uh, you know, highlighted a startling figure, which in 2019, which isn't that far back, there were only 65,000 uh, R&D tax claims. Um, and when you think about the number of, of businesses out there and you think of the level of innovation that happens um, in the UK, you know, there, that's a startlingly low figure. Um, so I thought we would just kick off, um, Mark, if you could kind of give us a, a flavour of, of the, you know, what, what is R&D tax credits? Uh, give us a whistle stop tour before we then go on to kind of a wee bit more detail about what kind of activities yourself and Ian f found eligible within within Fisher Smith and, and then beyond, you know, and where other businesses. And as I say, please ask questions and we'll, we'll jump in at the end. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Rich. Um, yeah, so the, <clears throat> the R&D tax relief scheme, um, <clears throat> it was introduced in the UK in the year 2000. Um, uh, bizarrely, it was the last OECD country in the UK to actually introduce the um, R&D tax relief scheme. Um, but having said that, over the last 20 years, the, the value of the scheme has increased quite a lot, um, particularly since the coalition government came in in 2010. Um, there's two schemes. There's one for small and medium enterprises and one for large companies called the Ardex scheme. Broadly, if you have under 500 employees within a group, the, ch the chances are you'll be an SME as opposed to a large company, um, which means that you get a more generous tax relief because, as you can imagine, the, the revenue um, and, and the government want to incentivize SMEs and help them a lot more than they would large companies, which makes sense. Um, so basically, um, to be to qualify for R&D tax relief, there's two main criteria. Well, there's three, but there's two that the third one comes from that. The first is that you've got to be trying to develop something that's either better than what's out there already or trying to make something that is new in some way. So what the revenue deem that to be is an, an advance in technology. When you say an advance in technology, you think of sort of guys in white coats in a lab. It's not as it's not as um, you know difficult as that. It can just be some, making something better in some way than what's out there already, like I say, or you can be developing something new that um, solves a problem. So that's the first thing. You have to be doing something that um, is new or better than what's out there already or trying to do so because seeking to make an advance also qualifies even if you don't actually achieve that. Um, the other thing which um, the revenue look at with, more, with interest more so these days is what the technological challenges and uncertainties are behind that project. It's all going well making something better, but if it was straightforward, the, the chances are you've not had to spend time and effort um, you know, look, exploring the blind alleys and trying to develop technology. So if there are technological uncertainties there, that time that's spent overcoming that typically is what we look at as the qualifying R&D time. Um, so if you're if you if you're undertaking a project where you're trying to make something that's better or different in some way, and that there is there is there are some technical challenges, the chances are you will be doing some level of R and D. It might be small. It might be it might be you know something that takes a, you know a few months. It might be something that's been going on for several years in, in some cases. So if you are, are doing that, you can get tax relief additionally on top of what you already get. Now, for small and medium enterprises at the moment, for every pound you spend on research and development, you already get 19p back if you're, if you're profitable. You can get an extra up, uh, approximately 25 pence back in the pound. So a, a very significant amount you can get back. Um, that's going to go up from April 2023 because, of course, the tax rate is potentially going up to 25 pence in the pound. Um, so the, the relief you're getting there is you're, you're almost getting more back, in, well, not more back in tax, sorry, you're getting more than 50% of what you're spending back in tax relief. So it becomes more important from the April after next. Uh, for companies that made a loss that haven't paid tax, they can still claim up to 33p back in the pound as a payable credit. So it's quite a lucrative um, relief for SMEs. Um, large companies can get about 10p back in the pound. So even companies that are, that are large or are in a large group but might be small in nature, it's still worth looking at exploring these R&D activities. Thank you, Mark. And Ian, coming to you in terms of the, the kind of things that, that you know, better or new, as Mark said, you know, can you give us a flavour of the kind of things where you've been able to claim for? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think, I think probably the first thing just to add to Mark's list of criteria and one thing that we... Uh, fell foul off for a few years was that you need to be a limited company. You need to be paying corporation tax in order to, to reclaim this relief. So we started off as a as a partnership and actually re, reconstituted ourselves a few years ago in order to allow us to be able to claim for this because we thought there was there was some merit in doing that and therefore there was a tax relief we could be getting which we we previously weren't or weren't eligible for. So um, yeah, and, and as Mark said, uh, a lot of what we're doing in our business day to day is not, we're not creating new, new products that, you know, that, that people would normally say, wow, this is a you know, fantastic technological uh, breakthrough. We're generally using off the shelf components um, from, from various suppliers that, that are probably making those sort of advancements in, in the background but then what we're doing is solving specific problems with a lot of that hardware and often we're writing then um, some bespoke software in order to bring that together we may be designing uh, some aspects of, of that solution that are therefore unique and um, specific to a particular um, 
project or, or, or uh, solution that we're trying to to develop. So, um, yeah, we're, we're on, on the face of it, we don't appear to be ticking boxes really left, right, and centre for R and D tax credits. But actually, when we look at it in more in more detail, there are quite a few areas where we are generating things that are, you know, advancements. They are bettering what's out there. There there, there isn't anything off the shelf that we could do to replace that particular uh, aspect so we've got to create it ourselves sometimes that works sometimes that doesn't uh, and then yeah, normally what we end up doing is is collecting a few of these projects and then myself and mark go through them and i explain them and we sort of knock them backwards and forwards and mark will knock down the, the bits that don't qualify and ask questions to, to tease out other bits that that may um may, may qualify such as uh, even things like um some software licenses where we're using that to build something up with it and that's getting used in the in the process of, of developing a, a, a product or a solution uh, some or all of that may be may be eligible um, we've had things like mechanical jigs and fixtures if we've made them up um, bespoke to a to a, a, a solution that we're trying to to achieve um, and either that does or doesn't work so sometimes we, we create one of these fixtures in order to hold camera and apart and and things in in the right positions maybe manipulate it slightly and that project goes nowhere you know it doesn't turn into a sale that little proof of concept work doesn't happen and, and we're left with a, a unique bit of framework or something that can't be used for anything else because it's it's been designed for that and and there is you know some criteria that mark will, will will sort of prod me for and say you know can you reuse it can you resell it well no it's very specific to this okay in which case it's been consumed in 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 the r d process and, and that element can be claimed for it okay Mark, just elaborating on, on that, are there areas where, you know, particularly thinking of our kind of audience in the sort of industrial sphere where there are things you they may not think are eligible that 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 are in fact um worth claiming for? And obviously what, what are the red flags? You know, what, what should people avoid and what are the HMRC looking for um in terms of auditing these claims? Yeah, um, I think the, probably the, the key one that people tend to leave out are where a project hasn't been successful. So you might be approached by a, by a potential end user and they might, they'll say, can you develop this for us? And nine, nine times out of 100, you'll say, yeah, yeah, we can do that. And then you worry about how you're going to actually do it later. Now, sometimes you might spend time and effort developing something, but it was too difficult um, for whatever reason that is that actually probably stands up better to HMRC than something that was easily successful because it, it proves that there is a difficulty behind that project and development. So a lot of the time we'll, we'll speak to people about projects they've done. They'll say, yeah, we've managed to develop this, did this, this, this. And then they'll say, well, we didn't get anywhere with these ones. We spent three or four months on them, but they didn't come to anything. They're the sort of projects you actually want to be putting into the claim and saying to HMRC, we have tried these as well, but because of how difficult it, what we do is, you know they, we've not managed to actually make them work so that's i would say one of the main areas where you'll see people missing out on um, areas you know the, the potential r d tax relief they spent money on um, another area um i've not really touched on it much but um it's, it's certainly relevant to what, what i do with ian um some some projects might get subcontracted or subsidized now often come and say well they, they they paid us to do that so we can't claim for it although you can't under the sme scheme you can then still claim but under the less generous large company scheme um so even if you've been subcontracted to do something and you don't really bear the risk of that development there is potentially a chance to claim relief under the less generous but still it's still money that you can claim back from hmrc um, scheme so that's another area where it might not be worth dismissing it straight away. It's, it's still worth speaking um, to a to a specialist to, to find out whether you can claim that. Yeah, and, and we've had that as part of our claim for for a few years, where um, we've had a couple of big aerospace companies approach us to to look at fairly new technologies for their their workflow using the equipment that we supply, and it's been a big development project. And we've been able to to claim back some of that, like Mark said, on on the that lower value scheme because 
we were being subcontracted by that large aerospace company to to, to do that work for them. And, and there was a risk to it. You know, we've, we've had one of those where we spent well over a year um, working on that for them. And when COVID hit, the whole thing got, got scrapped. So, you know, it, it, it gets to a point it, it wasn't fully adopted and, and it's now been rolled back and taken taken off the, the factory floor. So, yeah. And, and, and yeah, we, we have quite a few projects where they start, like Mark says, they, you know, the customers approach us or we've identified a place in the market where we could potentially go with, with a, a solution and we go a certain distance and then realize uh, actually, yeah, it, it, it's, it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. And as so long as we've recorded that, then we can, we can add it to our uh, uh, amount of time that, that can be reclaimed from the, the tax credits. Okay. And just before we come on to the kind of the, how, the claim process, um, Mark, can you just give, give us a flavour of some of the things that are worth of avoiding you know, and staying clear? Yeah, of? I mean, I've, I've made a list of a, of a few things where you, you might want to, these are, these are sort of red flags to HMRC, I guess, if you, if you were to make a claim. Um, one, so if you're making something that's a tweak or, or a minor change, what the revenue you're looking at is trying to make something that's a bit of a step change or an appreciable improvement. So if you're trying to develop something that's better than what's out there already, I'll just make sure that you're making something that is, an, is, a, is a sort of step improvement. So, for example, if you're trying to achieve, you know, X mega, megabits per second speed, the internet speed quicker than, you know, and the, and the industry standard is only... It's frozen for a minute. <laughs> oh, sorry. Are you, are you okay now? Yeah. Yeah, I'll keep going anyway. Um, things that are unique to the company don't necessarily um, um it has to be unique it has to be the advance has to be to the industry not not just in, internally so you have to be trying to make something that's better a, across the industry as a whole um things like aesthetics aren't necessarily qualifying because if you're trying to make something look better as much as part of the process it's not technological so that's just something to, to, to avoid claiming for and if you make something that's cheaper than what's out there already if you're doing that through technology that's fine so if you're doing if you're developing something in a different way to make it cheaper that's great but i think sometimes companies will get confused and they will try and claim for something oh so we've made this cheaper how have you done that oh we sourced a different supplier that's that's obviously commercial you know as much as you want to potentially be doing that it's um, something that doesn't fall in the, the remit of r d okay yeah and, for, and from several of our projects um you know they just don't qualify because we are you know, using off-the-shelf equipment and we're really just configuring it. And one of Mark's tests that he, he challenges us with is, is you know, could somebody else in your industry have basically achieved the same end result with, with that equipment? And it's like, yes, a competent person with equivalent skill set would have been able to just drop onto this and, and do it, in which case there's no advancement to the overall um, technology. But if we're doing something that's not easily achievable by somebody else with a, with a you know a, a reasonable level of knowledge is taking an amount of development somebody else would have to again do the same amount of development they wouldn't just drop onto it and and, and pr- provide a solution straight away then that then that counts but the stuff that's yeah the bread and butter stuff i guess that that we do generally doesn't count because yeah. you know, it's a paid for project we're not advancing anything we're just configuring equipment that's already there deploying it getting it signed off it works you know, there's no there's no advancement to that it's only when we start doing something more unique bespoke or technologically challenging and that that then that tips into the qualification okay and coming on in then to to flow lens and how how it has helped and um, it would be good to sort of describe um the kind of level of detail that you need to capture and, and you know what tools within flow lens you're using then to capture that and then analyze it at, at the sort of claim point yeah so so maybe just to sort of rewind on that before we had flow lens and, and when we first approached mark to uh to, to do our first claim we didn't have flow lens in place and we you know were going through the those initial couple of conversations with Mark of of describing what we did what the type of work we were doing so he could get an understanding of what what we were uh, what what sort of activities that we were doing would qualify and that was quite a you know it it took us several meetings to go through the different projects that we had and start to document them 
and then of course the question is well okay you told me about that project how much time did you spend on doing that because it's the the amount of time um generally is is the the thing we're we're claiming for and, and therefore this, the salaries of of staff and the percentage of that time that's spent on on r d is is what gets put into the claim so we were then going back through old projects and work trying to work out historically how much time do we spend on that who was working on it how much you know did, did that time get split out between this person and that person on, on that particular project and and that was quite you know it was quite a, quite a hard process going back over you know projects that might have finished 18 months ago when we were actually preparing the claim to look at it and say right you know well how, how much time was was spent on there you know we're, we're scratching around with whatever time recording systems that we that we had which were a bit uh, patchy to say the least um and then really once we got to to the point of making that that first claim you know mark and i sat down and said well how do we make this easier next year uh, what what do we need to to have in place in order to to make this a slicker process um, because we can, we've got the building blocks for everything here. We know the, the format, the, the questions to ask ourselves, what we need to, 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 to write down in order to put into the claim documentation to substantiate it. It's getting that data feeding in, you know, just as a drip on a daily, you know, general business cycle. How do we, how do we capture that? And, it, you know, most of it is now we've got flow lens in place. We've got a place to put that, which is generally in the in the projects module, and we've now got the ability to to record time uh, in timesheets and, and log that against the project. So then, when Mark and I meet again, I can very quickly just pull up a, a report or a, a screen on on FlowLens, list out the projects that you know started or ended in the last twelve months, and then go into each of one of those review the timesheets I can see who spent what time on which bits and you know for some stuff where it's you know it's time spent with a customer commissioning on site there's no advancement there that's just you know part of our our day job you can instantly knock those out so just recording the time against the project and categorizing that time just becomes a routine thing that we get all, all of us to do on a weekly basis just just log in, I spent that on this project, that on this project, it was doing this. And then we start to have that, that nice long list uh, that we can very easily pull out that data at, at the end of the year and cross off the bits that don't qualify and add up the bits that do in order to get those, uh, those figures out. From your point of view, Mark, then does that, that gives you more confidence then that the, the information that you're compiling is accurate yeah absolutely um i mean to be honest the um there's not an absolute prerequisite you have to keep records because the the, the scheme intends for smes not to have a massive administrative burden on themselves but what would happen is if if the uh, the revenue opened an inquiry into a claim they would say what basis have you used to allocate percentages to staff that, that qualify for r d and having backup records like this does the world of good in a situation like that so it it makes sense like ian says um just looking at a retrospective point of view being able to go back and say we in 2019 how long did we spend on this project it's so much easier doing it when you're doing the records as you go along than it is as he'll tell you from our first meeting it was um yeah it was it was it took absolutely ages to sort out but the since then, it's, it's been a lot easier. And you know, like I say, it's benefit of hindsight, um, having all that information available and allocated to the projects that are ongoing at any given time. And, and if we've got a project that's not, you know, that, that we think is speculative, it is a, an R&D one, we can just create a project in FlowLens for that, even if it's not attached to any given customer or a sale, we can just create a project to just record some time into there. And if it goes somewhere, great. If it doesn't, then we've just got that as a little, a little pot against which we can say, yeah, there we go, that one we tried, didn't work, but yeah, somebody spent a few days of time on it and we can add that to the to the claim. Just conscious of time here, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, a couple of questions, 
what about materials that you're using? You know, you mentioned the, the prototype uh, enclosure frame that earlier on, you know, the, those kind of things eligible as well? Yeah, I mean, the, the main costs um, that you can claim for R&D relief, uh, um, the, the vast majority will relate to the time that's been spent on it, whether, whether that's people internally within the business or external subcontractors used for research and development purposes. Any materials that are used up and consumed, um, they can also be claimed. Um, I appreciate that sometimes you, if you're buying in tons and tons of material like steel or something, it's impossible to tell how much of that has been used on a specific project. But if you've got records of what you've bought and when, at least again, with HMRC, from HMRC's point of view, you've got a basis of saying, well, we did buy X amount of um, material in that period. Um, so we're, we're going to I've seen a proportion that's been spent and used up in R and D. That's be, that's a better basis than just taking the cost of sales figure from the accounts and using that, for example. So the more it can be broken down, the better you've got a, a sort of um, you know, an argument for your judgment, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And what what about uh, testing stroke hardware devices? This is a question from Dimitri. Um, so what about testing hardware devices like oscilloscopes and, and even computers? Um, the, the generally the problem with the things like computers and hardware <clears throat> is that they're capitalised on the balance sheet. So the, the scheme is revenue in nature. So if something's written off in the P and L, it can potentially be claimed it's been used up in R and D. The thing with, um, I mean, computers are a bit of a grey area because <clears throat> they are normally written off over two or three years. If something generally lasts more than two years, it's capitalised. So you can't theoretically claim it. If it's <clears throat> something that's written off in, in a year and it goes through the p &L, it's something that's been used, it's going to be you know used up in six months to a year, then potentially it can be claimed, but you'd have to speak to your accountant and say that this would have to go through as a, as a profit and loss item, not something that's capitalised and depreciated down. So in general, we, we, we tend not to, but there, there are scenarios where computers do get used up in a, in a very quick period of time and just get written off as an expense. If that happens, we, we can put them in. Mm -hmm. Are my children involved in any of your R&D projects? Because they, they, <laughs> they go through yeah. computers pretty... Yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. Um, I'll put a lot of everything, doesn't it? <laughs> what about um, describing the activities, just to, to close up, uh, Mark? You know, there's an, a knack to, to actually describing the, the en enhancement or the advancement. Yeah, so like I say, um, you, it, making it clear to, to the revenue how how what you're doing is seeking to make an advance in technology um so where if you can make it quantitative it, it, it adds a bit of weight to it so if you're saying that the output speed's gone up from 100 units a minute to 160 units a minute in a process for example that's a quite clear advancement that you're trying to make and again remember you're saying what you're seeking to do it might not actually be achieved but as long as you can show those parameters to hmrc what, what you're attempting then that that demonstrates the advanced part of it the technical difficulties, I mean, again, you, you, I think it's important to distinguish between what's a commercial difficulty and what's a technical difficulty. So if you're saying we had problems with this project because the suppliers weren't getting back to us, that's obviously not technical. But if you're saying we couldn't get this to work because one of the parts was um, going against this because of space constraints, so we had to completely redesign it. That's when you start getting to the realms of actual technical, technical difficulties. And the more of those you can give to HMRC, the more there is that, that you know, they say, well, that's that obviously something that's taken a long time to be able to do. And the other thing I'd say is, Flowlands can help with this, I would, I would say, is keeping a, a chronological timeline of what you've done and when, because then, again, HMRC, if you're looking at claims for 2021, they will, they'll be saying a, a lot of that time, staff could have been on furlough or anything like that. So it's even more important to say, well, while we were working, we were doing this for the, for the other eight months from July through to March, let's say, 2021. Um, so keeping good records of what you have done as you've been going along really helps to build a picture and a story to HMRC, which makes them less likely to start delving into your claim and, and it causes all sorts of unnecessary bother if you get an inquiry. So it's, it's best to try and avoid it by being as proactive as you can with, with what you're recording data-wise. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, thank you, um, Mark, and thank you, Ian. Um, that brings us neatly to 11.30. Um, and I... Just in closing, yeah, I appreciate everyone's uh, everyone's time and I appreciate how again Flow Lens makes that sort of subtle impact um, on the outlying parts of the business activity, not just the day-to-day -day piece, um, similar in, in a way to the ISO uh, audit kind of process. And that allows me to give a, a little plug to a, a webinar that we're going to do on the 11th of January with uh, Ray Dodd from On Systems. And Ray is going to take us for a tour through uh, a sort of mock-up uh, flu lens uh, system 
on how he uses uh, forms in Flowdowns in particular to drive continuous improvement and drive quality management. Um, so uh, tune in for that on the 11th of January. Um, so thank you very much, Ian, again, for your for your time and, and Mark. I um, appreciate the insights and uh, we'll see everyone again soon. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.